and again welcome to another session of Web Chat, sponsored by the Church of God International. I'm Bill Watson, and I'm here with my colleague, Mr. Wayne Hendricks. Hey, Hi, Wayne. Bill. How you doing? I'm all right. That's good. Good to see you here. Good to be here. And uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about a very popular, well-embraced and accepted traditional Christian holiday, Easter of all things. And Wayne, I think uh, both of us are going to basically compare a little bit of what the Bible has to say and how it sizes up to this tradition known as Easter. Right. Well, the fact is that Easter predates Christianity by well over a thousand years. And that's an interesting point. Yes, That indeed. is an interesting yes. point because in, in, in all due respect, I mean, a, a lot of people don't recognize that. That's true. Yeah. yeah that's true. And, and you were going to say? Well, uh, just that all over the Roman Empire, of course, which was uh, the, the known civilized world in, in that, at that time, uh -huh. Easter had already been a, a thousand year old tradition. Wow, yeah. exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah. And a lot of people in the traditional Christian community, they don't really recognize that. They, they don't really have the history that is uh, really embedded in this holiday. However, they will argue the point that Easter is indeed in the Bible. Well, they'll argue that, well, we should go ahead and celebrate Easter, even though it might have a, a, a pagan origin or it might be the name of a pagan deity or something. Nevertheless, the fact is, since the Lord was resurrected on Easter Sunday morning, that makes it Christian. And, and furthermore, they claim the word, the actual word, is in the Bible. And indeed it is. And where is that? It's in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 12. So let's turn there for a moment. And here we read here in chapter 12, what? Well, this is where uh, Herod had, uh, had uh, put to death some Christians, including uh, James, the brother of John. And uh, Herod wanted to please the people, of course. And so he was after Peter as well. And it mentions the days of unleavened bread in verse 3. And then in verse 4, when he had apprehended him, that is Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Well, the word Easter here is Pascha, and it is the word, the, the uh, Greek word for Passover. And you know, this goes to the point, I think, that many people, because we're, we're in an English society today, were vulnerable to being misguided and misdirected yes. and uh, brought to understandings that are really not necessarily true because we're not as strong in Greek in the New Testament and of course Hebrew in and the Latin. Old Testament. Yes. Yeah, and Latin. And it's important to remember and people for the most part don't remember and don't consider the fact that the, the Bible translators, the King James translators and other translators as well of, of different Bibles, uh, they were the product of their religious upbringing. Right. They had a paradigm that they had learned from the Roman church. Mm -hmm. And that paradigm found its way into the translation. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now it's interesting here though also, and, ma and many don't put a big emphasis on it, but in verse 3, and you read over it, although rather quickly, and, and most people do, but yet nevertheless it's mentioned, the days of unleavened bread. Yes. And, and then they bring in Easter in verse 4, but you, you would think, well now wait a minute, what are the days of unleavened bread? And yet most Christians, they don't even, you know, take note of that. And that would lead, if they would, probably to understand that Easter is a mistranslation, I would think. Indeed, and it's also significant that Luke, who was a Gentile mm -hmm. and, wrote and the, book the of author Acts. of the book of Acts, right. nevertheless, he references holy days that were in force and being observed by Christians. Yeah, scattered throughout yes. the whole book, yes, as a matter indeed. of fact. Yeah, as reference points, like you and I would use maybe uh, before our conversion, like Christmas, I'll see you at mom's house if we were brothers at Christmas time. That's right, he's, he's giving dates and, and times and days that relate in the memory of Christians. Right, yes. exactly. So, it actually, I mean, it begs the question, of course, and an answer to it, as to just, how did then Passover, if I understand us right here, get changed from Easter? Well, you have to remember that by the time of Constantine the Great, when he convened the Nicene Council, 325 year? A.D., okay. Christianity was 300 years old, essentially. And a great deal had happened in that amount of time. 
And uh, of course, there were many heresies. Uh, the Bible speaks about them uh, in the New Testament that even in the days of the apostles, while Peter and Paul and James and John were writing their epistles, mm -hmm. they all speak about the fact that apostasy and heresy was ramping up. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you'll probably make the case that the whole New Testament was a, a real large record of them kicking back on the encroachments of the Gnostics That's right. and the Docetics in many respects, so the New Testament, at least most of Paul's writings, certainly, it is a rebuttal to false doctrine. Right. It is a rebuttal to errors that were being taught. The record of their protective effort. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. And so by the time of 325 A.D., many uh, practices had entered into Christianity, as mm -hmm. it were, that were not uh, authentic, that were not actually Christian, that had no history in the Hebrew Bible and certainly had no history with the Lord Jesus Christ or with the Apostles. But a lot with Rome. But a great deal with Rome, exactly. yes. Exactly, yeah. And Rome's practice was to uh, bring other ideas in and other philosophies in and other religions in to accommodate people because all Rome cared about was Pax Romana. Mm -hmm. If people would behave and pay their taxes and submit to Rome, that's, that was their main concern. Right. And you can keep your religion if, you, if you'll behave. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. And part of it, though, also was the religion was to control the populace. Absolutely. A lot of their doctrines yes. were geared toward developing the psychosis, if you will, uh, in the people of uh, being fear-driven so that they would behave and that they wouldn't get too unruly. I remember reading books uh, about guys uh, like Cato and different philosophers of Rome where they would go into the bathroom houses and laugh about how they were duping the people, so to speak, you know, and, sure. and yeah. fooling them into yeah. uh, control, uh, controlling the masses. And controlling the masses is, is the key to why the Nicene Council was convened, of course. Mm -hmm. Constantine the Great, the only emperor called the Great Emperor, as it were, was able to bring the East and the West together by <clears> means of a universal or common, or Catholic religious system. And that's what the word Catholic means. It literally universal. means that, yes. Yeah, it means like universal. A common or universal belief system. Right. And he was, he was very smart in that respect, and he understood that if you can control men's minds and hearts through religion, that's real power. Yeah. That's power that transcends military power. Right. And, and to that point, uh, friends who are viewing as well, uh, there was a lot of controversy leading up to this, and I think Wayne, uh, as we go through this, we can we can talk a little bit about how the Mithra religion and and different as as we had um, alluded to before, perhaps in regards to the fact that Easter's history precedes the uh, Easter of our. Christian form or flavor, as they would say, because oh, yes. there was controversy going on as the Roman church was attempting to try to change it through those 325 years, let's call it, for lack of a, a better uh, term here, that were illustrative of the conflict that was ongoing. I remember uh, in the second century, a guy named Polycarp, Yes. Who debated with, um, I guess, a quasi-emperor of sorts, uh, Pope, I should say, Antecetus, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the Passover and the Easter controversy. Yes, it was already a big controversial issue, of course. And that goes around, what, 150 A.D. or so? Uh, thereabouts, yes, yeah. because Polycarp was actually a student and disciple of the Apostle John. Yeah, first who generation. Who died yeah. about the year 100 A.D. Right, right. And, and so he had been taught directly by someone who really knew the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and he clung to Nisan the 14th, hence the term quarto deciman. Which was controversy. a big controversy yes. during that time. Quarto deciman literally meaning the 14th, of course. And, and it, it was pitted the controversy the about whether was. Passover would be kept on Nisan the 14th, as John had taught Polycarp and his other followers, or would it be kept the way the Romans had started to keep it for a long time already, uh, based upon the first sun day, sun being very significant, the first sun day following the vernal equinox or the spring equinox. Which has which no is reference. exactly the way Easter is determined even today. And has no reference to the has, Bible. Has none whatsoever. Exactly. It has reference entirely 
to keeping Easter or mm -hmm. Easter or mm -hmm. Easter or mm -hmm. Oster. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Polycarp's position was to try to preserve the 14th because yes. he represented and came as a representative of the East, the Eastern churches. Exactly. And also, not just because of the, the tradition that existed in the Eastern, he actually had scripture to back him up, of course, because mm -hmm. Passover had always been on Nisan 14. So this really does, my friends, I mean, this really does present an interesting consideration from this standpoint that most traditional Christians, regardless of whether or not they're Catholic or not, I mean, you can be a Baptist, you can be a Presbyterian, you can be a Methodist, you can be whatever Protestant denomination you may be, but in all fairness, I guess you have to admit the fact that if you do embrace Easter, you're embracing a Catholic traditional holiday. Is that well, a fair that, statement? Is uh, that well, a, certainly it is. Uh, an honest, unbiased study of the traditions and teachings of, uh, of Christianity at large, as it exists for the most part in, in most de denominations, one would have to conclude and admit, as does the Catholic Church claim, that the doctrines and traditions of Protestantism are a, are a direct result of Catholic teaching. And influence. And indeed they are. Yeah, yeah. There, you cannot deny that. And uh, there, there's a great deal of scholarship and academicia to support that and back that up. Which, again, uh, goes back to this proof of, um, of how influential the Catholic Church has been upon Christianity. I mean, where did Sunday come from? You know, you could, you could talk about even Christmas. I don't want to digress too much, but a lot of this has its roots back in the influences of and encroachments of the universal church. Yes, well you have to remember that the, the, the Protestant Revolution is only 500 years old. And so you had 1500 years uh, essentially prior to that of, of, of entirely Roman tradition and teaching. Right, right. And if you didn't abide by what Papa said, yes. Oh boy, you yes. were in trouble. Yes. Yeah. And there was a there was a a natural uh, movement on on the part of uh, the bishops in Rome and the and the clergy people in Rome to uh, to take control because Rome was the capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by the time of Constantine, when he had his alleged conversion which, uh, you know, a, a study of, of uh, Constantine would uh, certainly at the very least question whether that was a, a genuine right. Christian conversion. But he was a good light, politician. In, in light of the fact that he murdered some of his own family afterwards and did some things that we really can't even talk about on this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so he was a, uh, a, a very powerful individual, mm -hmm. and what Constantine wanted, he got. And so... And he actually, if I understand right, uh, pretty much ran that council. Well, absolutely. He summoned, uh, as I recall, it was 290 bishops from all over the uh, known Christian world, mm -hmm. the Roman world, and he summoned them to uh, Nicaea for a council to come to a Catholic conclusion, mm -hmm. a universal or common conclusion about doctrine, including mm -hmm. the nature of God and the nature of Jesus Christ and the the quarto deciman controversy. As institution to when, of Sunday? Yes. Uh, will we continue to keep the Roman tradition or will we uh, allow some Christians to continue keeping the Eastern tradition the, to follow the teachings of John and his disciples or will we have a common universal or Catholic teaching wherein all Christians will keep the same beliefs the same doctrines, the same holy days, the same days of worship, and so forth. And this was a major effort on their part to merge and integrate these pagan traditions and leanings and slants that were actually extrapolated right raw out of Mithraism. Uh, they became, uh, of course, influenced through the Hellenistic movement, the Gnostics and the Docetics, uh, of which reach back to the philosophers of Plato and Socrates, yes. yeah. to Egypt, and then even before that, Babylon. And you know, to uh, the point that we were making before on how Easter preceded in uh, the case of, uh, was preceded in, in uh, the case of pagans using uh, pagan religions, over here in the book of Ezekiel, 
I wanted to point this out, I think over in chapter 8, because this goes to a, an event that is still being done today by many traditional Christians uh, that uh, are still doing this, and it's amazing that it's listed right here way back in about 600 B.C., back in the days when Judah was under and in captivity uh, by the Babylonians. And what you're about to reference is actually, uh, in many respects, the most revered custom in Christianity at large today. Presently, yes. yeah, to get yes. up early on that Sunday morning mm -hmm. and go out for a sunrise service. I can remember as a child going to uh, not just a few, Easter Sunday morning sunrise services. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, I dropped out of my Methodist following when I was five years old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my mom and my dad couldn't take me to church anymore because they dropped out and I didn't drive All yet right. at five. <laughs> well, coming from the South, I had more of that Southern Baptist background. Yeah. <laughs> but here it says, and to, the, to our point, uh, in verse 13, uh, Ezekiel is being directed to look at some abominations I mean, that's the category mm -hmm. we're being uh, uh, told here about this event. And he says, He said also unto me, Turn you yet again, and you shall see greater abominations than they do. And then he proceeds and he says, He brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat a woman weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz being a, uh, a pagan deity going back again uh, into ancient times. Right. Very ancient at this point already. Tammuz being the son of uh, Nimrod, as it were, and Semiramis. And Semiramis is actually another name for Easter or Ishtar. There you go. Yes. And that is going way back Indeed. into uh, yes. the Tower of Babel with Nimrod and yes. so on. I mean, you're, you're Tammuz, going back just this side of the flood now. Tammuz, in effect, was a savior figure. Mm -hmm. and, and the mother and the child. The, you have the Madonna. This the Madonna, is the first yeah. reference to a Madonna that we know of. Exactly. Yes. And so he continues and he says here in verse 15, Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn you yet again, and I shall show you a greater abomination. And then he proceeds to describe 25 people turning their backs uh, to the temple and their faces toward the east as they worship the sun toward the east as yes. it was rising. Yes. Yeah. That sounds like an Easter sunrise. It is amazing, my friends, that it, today there are a multitude of denominations that still take uh, part in this kind of a, a traditional event, and which goes to certainly illustrate a point here uh, that, um, you know, these things do precede what we have been taught to believe, of all things, that Easter is a Christian tradition or a Christian holiday. And it comes from the, the reasoning, the faulty reasoning, the incorrect reasoning, of course, that uh, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead at sunrise on Easter Sunday morning, that makes it Christian. And so there's nothing pagan in any way connected to it. However, the fact is, the Bible makes it very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ was three days and three nights in the tomb and he did not rise from the dead at sunrise on Sunday morning. And that is in your Bible. It the, says three days and three nights. It's not even debatable. The Bible is very clear. That's right. And Jesus even references the Hebrew language. Now, a lot of people don't recognize that. They, they look at the story uh, that Jesus represents or references, I should say, references the story of uh, Jonah in the great fish. Uh, as he was three days and three nights. And the Hebrew language is definitely clear. That was three days and three nights. Exactly. As a matter of fact, the Lord used as a proof text that very scripture that he was indeed Messiah. The only sign that he would give from scripture that he was indeed Messiah was just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish so the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the earth. Exactly, and that is a very important recognition it is in regards to His Messiahship. Indeed. And there's another aspect of this that uh, is, is not usually considered, uh, especially after the time of Constantine and the Nicene Council. The, uh, the fact is, the, the Roman uh, clergy were very much aware that in order to 
discourage Judaizing, as they yeah, referenced it. Which was a big the, the, driving force. Yes, the timing in regards to the resurrection was of critical importance in that respect because the Jewish Christians, Christians who came from a Hebrew background and were familiar with the Hebrew Scripture, knew that the amount of time the prophesied Messiah was to be in the tomb had to be three days and three nights. So if you can put Messiah in the tomb late on Friday and have him resurrected Sunday morning, that's going to automatically make the Jews start moving away from you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that doesn't match the scripture. Right, and over here in Matthew 12, in bringing uh, our attention to this scripture of what we're talking about, it says here in verse 38, there were certain scribes and Pharisees answering, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. And he says, Boy, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. There shall be no sign. Uh, but he goes on here and he says, But uh, a sign shall be given, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights. And that Greek word means nights. It does indeed. And I've heard it, I remember as a child hearing this, uh, this claim that's uh, almost universally used in traditional Christianity. Uh, that is completely incorrect and, and unsubstantiated, and it is simply this, that there is a Greek idiomatic expression that mm. just simply means parts of three days. So that's what they use, and that's what they claim to say that, well, from late Friday afternoon to early Sunday morning takes parts of three days. Mm -hmm. And the Greek idiomatic expression is really being used here. Yeah, a lot of people but use the that. fact is, there is no such Greek idiomatic expression. Mm -hmm. Greeks know how to count just like you and I do. Mm -hmm. And there is no such grammatical expression in the Greek language. Mm -hmm. It simply does not it, exist. Yet a lot of people will use that I know to it, leverage but, but that understanding. It is entirely incorrect and was made out of whole cloth by someone at some point and it's been used, you know, ad, ad forever since then. But again, it's very illustrative of the influence of the Catholic Church on the whole Protestant belief system, the statement of beliefs of so many different Christian, traditional Christian denominations and the impact that they have had going back from that watershed moment in 325 AD of the Council of Nicaea yes, when uh, Constantine yes. conducted that. When Christianity was effectively hijacked. Precisely. By law. Good word, Wayne. Yes. Good word, because a lot of people, uh, I'll tell you, uh, don't view it that way. Well, that's, that's true, but you know, the Lord Jesus Christ said, the truth will make you free. Right. And uh, he also said that God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Bible defines truth. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus Christ also said in John chapter 17 and verse 17, Thy word is truth. Exactly. And, and the teachings of Jesus Christ and His apostles are very clear. If you cannot substantiate it in the Bible by, by, by Scripture or, or by the uh, example of, in their, their behavior, mm -hmm. then how, how can we make that Christian? Mm -hmm. Exactly. If it's important enough to you to want to worship, then wouldn't you want to do it in truth? And in spirit. And in spirit, of course. Right, the spirit of truth. And you know, it is uh, very um, serious on God's behalf on how He views our desire to aspire and investigate and explore for truth because He says, remember when Paul in 2 Thessalonians talked about the spirit of iniquity yes. or the movement of iniquity. That was already at work. work. Yes. And that a lot of that was underscored by the fact that people lost their love for the truth. Right. And it was God who sent them strong delusion as a result. And compromise was rampant. Very much and so. And people who had been steeped in their, their cherished traditions, mom and dad's religion that they were raised in, going back for hundreds or even thousands of years, they did not lightly give those things up. Mm -hmm. and, and so what they did was mix those things in with Christian teaching. 
Right, exactly. And, and you had a governmental initiative going on in Rome at the beginning in those early, new, uh, uh, early years there of the New Testament church uh, that afforded more uh, l credible leverage, let's say, powerful leverage in influencing the masses to stay in line with what the government was propagating and advancing. Exactly, yes. And once Constantine embraced Christianity, as it were, uh, and I have already mentioned the fact that his uh, conversion was very questionable. Mm -hmm. But after the, the emperor of the Roman Empire became Christian, then it was politically correct, of course, for the rest of the world to very quickly fall in line. Yeah. Because he's the commander in chief of those Roman legions. And because he did pass legislation that was very, very uh, punitive in yes. many respects, yes. that if you yes. didn't fall in line, you ran the risk of uh, being incarcerated, property taken. Ab absolutely, and by the time of some of his successors, by the time of Theodosius, for instance, it became imperial decree. You had to be a Christian, and you couldn't be anything else. Mm -hmm. But it was Christianity as defined by the Pontificus Maximus, who was the emperor. Yeah. At that point, not the pope. The pope is today known as Pontificus Maximus the Vicar of Christ and Pontificus Maximus. It wasn't until that was conferred upon them. Originally, that title belonged to the emperors of Rome, mm. the Pontificus Maximus. Mm -hmm. In other words... It was the, a shared role. The primary speaker, of course. Yeah. And as the emperor of, of Rome, he was first among equals, as it were, mm -hmm. of all Christians. Yeah, I, I remember watching the movie Gladiator. Yes. And uh, yes. That, that, was, uh, that was quite a movie there, you know, Aurelius and all. And, and once, once he became a Christian mm -hmm. and fought battles in the name of Christianity, and that was his motivation as a matter of fact, uh, he, he claimed to have seen a vision of a cross, as right. it were, yep. and he adopted that symbol then and made himself to be a Christian. And it was very clever because he was able to bring the, the empire together under a common or Catholic belief system. Mm -hmm. But what people fail to realize is that Constantine was then able to send the Roman armies out, the Roman legions out, and at the point of the sword, the entire world in very short order, in a very few generations, the entire known so-called civilized world had to become Christian. Mm -hmm. In that sense, But they were no more Christian fashion. in their hearts and in their minds than, uh, than, than a, you know, a stone would be. Right, right. And obviously a lot of the influences of those Eastern religions and the Babylonian and Egyptian influences yes. and the philosophies of Plato and Socrates, the immortality of the soul that the Docetics and the, the um, uh, Gnostics exactly. advanced, you know, where they literally said that Jesus was nothing more than an illusion, that even the crucifixion was nothing more than hallucinations yeah. and uh, that he wasn't real. You know, he never suffered. That he himself was the personification of, of holiness as the dove came on him that uh, basically became part and parcel to Jesus. But when Jesus was in his passion the night that he was betrayed, went away and became disembodied. Conscious, but it's disembodied. It's easier to believe Alice in Wonderland than some of the nonsense that's oh, been made up my. about the Lord Jesus. And, and to think, friends, to think that some of this stuff is still today considered Christian and that Christianity gets the rap that in some cases is so unnecessary and misdirected that frankly, you know, it's a no wonder, Wayne, that this statement, in my humble opinion, isn't so correct. And that is that the only thing wrong with Christianity Christianity today is it hasn't really been understood or practiced. Exactly. Christianity as delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ right. and as preached and practiced by His disciples and the apostles until Christianity was hijacked. That kind of primitive Christianity, original Christianity, the faith once delivered, mm -hmm. has seldom, if ever, been preached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the Apostle John, in his epistles, as he was aging and moving toward uh, the grave, the, the, his uh, place of safety, we'll say, um, he was adamant there. When you read in 1 John, his epistle there, and even 2 John, when he's talking about the Antichrist, you know, and, and he's 
excited. He's exercised over the fact about how people are veering off. He doesn't even give a salutation in First John. I don't know if you ever noticed that or not. I There's have. no salutation I there. Have, right. He just jumps yes. into his yes. subject. Yes. I mean, yeah. he, he's intense. He's adamant about the fact that, look, I saw him. I believed him. I watched him. I touched him. I felt him. He was manifested in the flesh, you know. Someone asked me once why John didn't give a, 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 a salutation there, and I said, John was old. He didn't have much time. He, did. he was urgent. <laughs> right. He was urgent on right. himself. He wanted to get that yeah, message right. out so yeah. badly to the people that uh, he was still serving there in uh, Asia Minor, you exactly. know, after he got off the Isle of But Patmos. you know, uh, again, uh, go going back to uh, uh, Constantine the Great, I don't think people realize that in all of human history, the whole human story, uh, few men have been uh, more influential uh, than Constantine the Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Christianity w has been defined more by as it is practiced in most of the world today, more by Constantine than by Jesus Christ. Wow. The fact is, the beliefs of Constantine found its way into Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. He was the most powerful man on earth. Mm -hmm. People catered to him. Mm -hmm. People sucked up to him. What Constantine wanted, Constantine got. And Constantine had been a a, a devout and pious devotee of Mithra. And when one begins to make a detailed study of Mithraism, mm -hmm. one finds out that there was an individual named Mithra who was the son, S-O-N, of the son, S-U-N, sun god, Saul Invictus. And he was the most revered deity in the, in the days of Constantine. And the generals and command officers of the Roman legions were followers of Mithra because it celebrated devotion to your leader. It celebrated courage. It celebrated uh, uh, being a, a good warrior, which was a ready-made religion for the Roman legions, of course. And the emperor, especially. Yes, and Constantine was indeed the high priest, the most ranking high priest of the Mithra religion prior to his alleged conversion. And that's why I say he was a good politician. He and knew how to market and leverage he was very his clever. influence. Oh, yes. very much so, yes. very much so. And, and unfortunately, uh, because he had the government behind him, and I think you're making that really clear, the dominance of the ability of the government to, to essentially stamp on top of the truth of what was going on in the undercurrent, yes. um, unfortunately became victimized by a lot of that dominance of the heel of Rome. But sadly, and it's unfortunate, many people don't come back to what the Bible talks about in regards to the holy days that are biblically uh, underscored. I want to, before we end this web chat, and, and time's beginning to run out on us, because we like to try to keep these down a little bit to maybe 40, 45 minutes at the most, uh, and we appreciate you staying with us here as we begin to try to conclude this, but I wanted to bring, Wayne, our attention back over here to, to Matthew, or I'm sorry, John chapter 19. John chapter 19 in this particular case, because a lot of people get stumbled on this with the, the uh, Friday night crucifixion, you know, yes. and the resurrection yes. on Sunday, but uh, as I think it does us well to explain to our viewers that because the Christians in this early Genesis embryonic time of the church were still keeping the holy days that are described in Leviticus 23. Now, if you want to take a look at those holy days, they're over there in 23 and they're all listed there in line, including the weekly Sabbath, by the way. But one of those holy days is right here and oftentimes misunderstood as being the weekly Sabbath, when in fact it's not the weekly Sabbath. It is Sabbath. not the weekly Sabbath. I think everyone knows, even in traditional Christianity, it is common knowledge that the crucifixion happened at Passover time. Right, exactly, on the 14th. That's what the Last Supper was all about. And that's a continuum yes. with the Old Testament. It goes back, reaches back, yes. connects up, yes. and brings forward this new uh, notion, this whole new tapestry, this whole new meaning of Christ fulfilling the sacrificial law as He becomes now the, the Lamb uh, for our sins. And of course, uh, on, upon a repentance and baptism, we can access well, eternal yes, life. Yes, the Apostle Peter refers to Him as the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
sinners. Exactly. And the blood of his sacrifice now on our hearts allows us to have the death angel, not the law. <laughs> the law doesn't pass over us. We are obligated. God has expectations on us for sure, without a doubt. Uh, but we are allowed to be passed over by the death penalty. That's what we're allowed to be passed over by. Exactly. The Lord Jesus Christ never observed Easter. Mm -hmm. For that matter, he never observed a Sunday worship service. Exactly. He never observed a Christmas, you know. And you'd say, well, all of that came later, of course, after the Lord's uh, ascension into heaven. But the fact is, and history records, that the apostles and the church, all the way up until the 300s AD, kept the holy days and worshiped on the seventh day of the week. Not the Sun first. Sunday being a, a, a day in which the sun worshipers of Mithraism favored. Right, exactly. And in John 19, just as we conclude here, I want to challenge all of you to take a, a nice time, take some time, that is, to study this word high day in verse 21. And I challenge you to come to grips with what that high day is really all about. Is it the weekly Sabbath or is it another type of holy day yes. that uh, the Bible is alluding to here that would put a lot more and make a lot more sense as you begin to read down through this sequence. Yes, well actually it's verse 31 mm -hmm. in, in chapter 19 yeah, 31. Of, of John's Gospel here. Right, exactly. So with that, let's go ahead. Uh, we're going to wrap this web chat up and uh, hopefully, if nothing else, uh, this information will compel some of you to uh, go ahead and uh, do some studying on your own to find out some of the information that we've shared here with you and confirm uh, between your own ears on your own studies because really that's where real change uh, comes to heart. So until next time, till next time, Bill Watson, Wayne Hendricks. So long. Saying, Goodbye to you, and we'll see you right back here again at another web chat session.